Well, I'm so glad you're all here and we're just gonna sit for um, 10 minutes just so that we have a chance to arrive completely. Um, if you can, if you prefer, you can uh, have your video off while you meditate or um, happy to have it on, but, but really just take this initial time just to really let yourself completely arrive. As the sound of the bell fades, just really feel your body coming into the space, taking your seat, welcoming every part of yourself, nothing left out. And just feel yourself in whatever space you're in. Being welcomed. Certainly being welcomed to this virtual Sangha. Really taking your place in this community. And you might just focus on the breath, if that helps you stabilize. Whatever seems most appropriate to make that transition from the busyness of before to this time of exploration and sharing some of our deepest spiritual values. You may want to do a little meta practice, beginning with yourself.
So today we're on our 10th and last uh, Parami, and it is one of the most uh, multifaceted and really, really interesting. It's equanimity. Um, and the Pali word is upeka. And it's translated equanimity. People also talk about it as composure. Um, impartiality, balance, resilience, those are all some aspects of, of equanimity. Um, and uh, you know, equanimity, interestingly, it comes up in, in a number of places in, uh, in the Dharma. It's not only one of the um, 10 paramis, but it's also one of the Brahma Viharas, which are the um, the states of mind that the Buddha said, you know, one of these states is always available to us, either loving kindness, which is, you know, that sort of friendly, benevolent um, response to the world, uh, compassion, which is the uh, recognition of suffering and the very wholesome desire to alleviate it, sympathetic joy, which is um, gladness in the good fortune, of others, 
And then the last is, uh, is equanimity. And equanimity is, um, is that uh, state of, of being unshaken by the, the winds of, um, of the world. And it's interesting that in uh, the Theravadan Vipassana tradition, equanimity is uh, the last of the Brahma Viharas to be taught because it's often regarded as um, it's something that you acquire with spiritual uh, maturity. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that takes um, quite a while to develop. And I don't know if any of you have ever um, heard the phrase that here's sometimes in, in Dharma circles that you know, spiritual maturity is giving up all hope of a better past. So uh, you know, equanimity is, is this ability to be with um, how things are. Interestingly, in the Tibetan tradition, as I understand it, and for those of you who've practiced, um, you can correct me <laughs> because this is book knowledge, not personal knowledge. But I understand in, in the Tibetan tradition, sometimes equanimity is taught first as the ground in which all the other states can, um, can arrive. But equanimity has a, a pretty obvious far enemy. You know, in the Brahma Viharas, you talk about the, the, the um, quality that is the opposite of the, um, of the virtue or state of mind. And then the near enemy is the one that, that sort of looks like it, um, but, uh, but isn't, isn't it really. And the far enemy, of course, to equanimity is reactivity. It's that sense of being overwhelmed or it could be any sort of um, extreme state, even an extreme state of grief, an extreme state of despair, of anger. It's that, that sort of very, very reactive extreme. And one way equanimity is sometimes characterized is not falling to either extremes, that equanimity is always kind of balanced in the middle, doesn't fall to, to extremes. Um, so the um, so the far enemy is pretty pretty clear, and the near enemy is indifference. What seems to be equanimity, but isn't really, and um, so don't confuse this. For those of you who've done the four foundations, where you talk about mindfulness of the body mindfulness of feelings, Vedna, you know, mindfulness of mind, Chitta, and, and mindfulness of the dharmas. This isn't about that sort of Vedna neutral feeling, which is actually upekka, and then there's another Pali word on it. It's a compound word. But that, that, that Vedna feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, is a feeling. We're talking now about a quality or a state of mind. So it's not that, because that is kind of an, an indifference in the in the feeling. So it's not, um, uh, it's, it's not indifference. And indifference is in fact um, the near enemy. It's, uh, it's that not caring. Um, and in the Buddha's final words, um, he urged his practitioners to be, and the Pali word is apamada. And that's usually translated as being um, vigilant, heedful, um, diligent. And it's really interesting to me that Stephen Batchelor translates that word apamada as being careful. Careful both in the sense of being vigilant, being mindful, being alert, but also in that sense of being full of care, care for others. And, um, and I've always found that to be a very, um, sympathetic uh, translation uh, of, that, um, of that word that often gets, gets translated as, as heedful or, or diligent. The opposite in Pali, just if any of you are interested, is, is pamada, which means negligent, um, indolent. Uh, the root of it is sort of being intoxicated or inebriated. 
So this is the opposite of this. Uh, this idea that that in um, our equanimity, there's this sense of of being attentive, of being vigilant, of being careful. Equanimity is sometimes likened to um, bamboo as being very strong, very resilient, um, able to um, weather all kinds of storms without outbreaking. It's a remarkably useful, resilient material that just can bend back and forth, but it's also you know, extremely strong for, for building. And many of you have probably, if you haven't been to Southeast Asia, you've probably seen photographs that you know, all the scaffolding is made out of, out of bamboo. It's an extremely uh, strong, resilient, useful material. And, and that's often what um, equanimity is um, compared to. It's the ability to be with things as they have come to be. Usually, you know, when we're talking about being mindful, we're saying, you know, mindful to be with things as they are. But if instead of saying as they are, we pay attention, being able to be with things as they have come to be, because that really in, is grounded um, in the um, first part of the Eightfold Path, the idea of wise view. So this is, this is equanimity has a lot to do with this idea of, of wise view, of being able to be grounded in um, kind of the, the big picture. It's, it recognizes the causal nature of all experience. And this is, is really what um, this understanding that everything is caused. What happens, happens due to cause and effect. Those causes can be physical, they can be biological, they can be meteorological, um, you know, but everything that happens happens because of prior causes. So it's not that this is a world where things are random and, and spontaneous. And equanimity sees that, sees how things have come to be, recognizes this um, important uh, progression of, of causes and often seeks to um, to understand that. So I sometimes say, and this is really the teaching of, of karma, right? That we are the inheritors of our own past actions, the owners of our present actions, and the fabricators of our future actions. And I, I, um, I've often found it most helpful to talk about karma in terms of you can only eat what's on your own plate. That what we we work with are our own um, the uh, the results of our own our own actions, and of course you know we deal with the weather, we deal with the other sorts of all the other causes um, in our lives. You know we deal with COVID nineteen, we deal with all these sorts of things that have been caused. But in the karmic field, you know what we work with um, are the the results of our own our own actions and then our intentions to, um, to act um, in the future. And of course, the big teaching of, of equanimity is that the outcome we intend may elude us. And this is what, because there are so many other causal factors. So equanimity is this, um, composed, um, resilient, uh, big picture understanding, big picture understanding of impermanence. Everything that arises will pass away. Everything is impermanent. All of our experience is imperfect. Right? Everything's imperfect and Everything is 
uh, impersonal. It's sort of the impersonality of phenomena. So we can talk about kind of our pandemic here and that we're all um, in our own way um, struggling with how do we how do we live our lives in these in these situations? Not a situation that we personally caused. Not uh, you know, this has just this is how things have come to be. So how do we work skillfully with that, making the best choices we can without any any guarantee about an outcome? How do we bring our our practice to that? And you know, it it seems to me that uh, it's just really helpful to um, to have that sort of humility about about the big picture, um, and to realize this the sort of limited scope of our own our own actions. Uh, I was talking with. Um, a friend of, of mine who's also a mother, I'm a mom, I'm a grandmother, and uh, a friend who's a mom, and talking about our adult children, and just saying, you know, that we have such limited agency, and even when they were children, when they were tiny children, you know, we had limited, limited agency, and now as adults, we have even more limited agency. And we can want the best for them and wish the best for them, but uh, we have no, no control. Control is, is an illusion. So we were saying that all we have, all we really have is compassion. And I'm gonna talk about that at the end because one of the, the very interesting ideas about um, equanimity is that it really does provide the grounds for the most profound compassion. Um, so we have this, um, you know, we have our, our good intentions, we work with our, um, our best intentions, and, you know, life happens. Um, and COVID comes and we don't go on retreat and we don't have this job and, and you know, things are just as they have come to be. And we can understand how they've come to be. And we might even say that in, in some ways, our lifestyle may have, you know, in some small way contributed to this because the, the suggestion is, you know, with, with many of the uh, zoonotic diseases, diseases that come from animals into us, that what happens is that the Viremium, the, the kind of place where it is, gets disturbed by human beings entering entering into that habitat. Uh, that and then the viremia gets out into into the human world, and um, that's partly because we are exploiting resources all over the world. Our lifestyles of of consumption. So we can we can see that we might um, be part of this great constellation of causes and conditions not in control but that we are are contributing um, to this so having some um, maturity about our our situation um, and and not being overly um, well not being reactive at all, it's overly reactive, but um, you know the, the sort of um, hissy fits that people are having about other people not being masked. Um, you know, you might request that they put on a mask, but it's kind of out of out of your control whether they do it or not. And um, so this has been really a a wonderful platform for. Um, uh, practice. I want to tell you though, I, I have two little things before we get into a, a discussion. Um, one is the first time I ever heard about this idea about you know not being attached to an outcome long before I had any inkling of 
Buddhist practice. Back in the 80s when I was running an organization, an arts organization, and um, there was someone on the board who was very wealthy, the wealthiest person. And she would always show up at that meeting. She was just, she would, you know, if there was a committee meeting, she would show up. Some of the academics would, some of the, I mean, she was just the best board member ever. And she came and she was just really straightforward. And um, it, it sort of um, upended my stereotype about the very, very wealthy. And so I said to her once, now I just really appreciate that you, you always show up at the meetings when you say you're gonna be here. And she just looked at me and she said, Patrice, I have four rules for life. Show up, pay attention, tell the truth, and don't be invested in a particular outcome. And this was just news to me. And it was also, I mean, I think it, it, it is so dharmic, uh, you know, that show up, pay attention, tell the truth, don't be invested in a particular outcome. And I also started using that to, I, I you know, was involved with a lot of organizations and I realized sometimes I just wouldn't show up. Um, sometimes I'd show up, but I wouldn't pay attention. And we didn't have cell phones then, but I'd had you know, something in my lap that I'd be, I'd be doing. And I just thought, you know, if I'm not willing to show up, if I'm not willing to pay attention, I don't belong in this organization. And I just kind of cleared my calendar. I mean, it was just a, a wonderful exercise in getting really clear about what mattered enough to me that I really wanted to show up, pay attention, really participate wholeheartedly, tell the truth. And then that last part about not being invested in any particular outcome. And I think that it, that was just so wise. And it was really clear that this person um, lived her life that way. Like years ago, I met a friend who said, I knew, I knew someone for many years, who said to me, you know what other people think of me is really none of my business. Again, just an amazing thought. But this is a person who really lived her life that way, a, very, a person with a lot of integrity. And so that was just a, a really, I have always thought about um, this person's um, four rules as just such a, a clear uh, guide. And I think it's a clear guide around the paramis. Um, too. Um, and because equanimity, you know, when, we, when we are practicing, we're really trying to see things, how they have come to be, both kind of in the, you know, how it is, in, but how they've come to be, we can take the really big view. Then the heart mind is naturally moved to compassion. Naturally moved to compassion. You know, sometimes when we hear the backstories of someone, you know, for, for many years, I've been, um, uh, until COVID-19, offering um, meditation in correction facilities. And, you know, when you hear the stories of how people got to where they are, you know, you can't help but feel compassion. And I think that that is, um, you know, such a, a benefit of, uh, of really being able to take this equanimous view, of really uh, trying to understand how things have come to be. And in some of our, um, you know, it, it's certainly been um, the work in uh, sort of social justice more recently, you know, how things have come to be. Well, why do we have a police force? Well, it started with having a force for people to capture enslaved people that escaped. So the roots of policing in the United States are, you know, it's deeply rooted in capturing enslaved people. That's a useful thing to know. That really helps us understand kind of the, um, the genesis of, of things, you know, knowing that, for example, the Second Amendment um, 
about the right to have a militia and bear arms was not, you know, like we need a little National Guard to help in, in times of trouble. It was to make sure that there was a militia that could um, counteract any revolution by enslaved people. So when we really come to see how does this come to be, how does it come to be that we have such a carceral state where so many people are in prison? How does it come to be? And equanimity is not this indifference. Equanimity is really clear-eyed. Okay, this is how it's come to be. What is a, a skillful response that isn't, um, isn't attached to any particular outcome? You know, what is a skillful response that, you know, to use that um, very famous metaphor by um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you know, sort of bends the moral arc. You know, we often, uh, Steve Armstrong, one of my beloved Dharma teachers, uh, used to say that, you know, when you're about to do something, just ask yourself, is this in alignment with my highest aspirations? And sort of that's what we, we do. We aim toward our, our highest aspirations, our wholesome goals and practicing all of these beautiful paramis. Certainly this, this kind of amazing wholesome uh, practice about uh, living with integrity. You know, it's all been about developing integrity. Uh, so it really, really helps us to respond um, more skillfully in these sorts of difficult situations, whether they're difficult situations, you know, with our family members, with our sangha, with our, you know, in whatever sort of system we're, we're embedded, being able to see clearly, this is how things have come to be, and understanding when possible how things have come, how, how to get this way, but understand how it has come to be. And then we can make a more skillful response, and the skillful response is very likely to be grounded in compassion. You know, I've always sort of wondered, why isn't compassion one of the paramis? Um, and I've heard people say, well, it kind of undergirds all of the paramis. But it was really interesting to me that several of the, um, of the teachers that I was reading and looking at in, in preparing these, these comments really said that compassion really comes out of, true compassion comes out of, of equanimity, that it's really skillful. It sees, um, it sees the suffering clearly. It has this um, very wholesome intention to alleviate that suffering if possible. And I think that's sort of if possible, not being attached to, to fixing. Um, and sometimes the only thing the compassionate person can do is bear witness. And that in itself may be um, a way of alleviating suffering, of being, being with. So I, I have, um, I think that that compassion, that, I'm sorry, that, that equanimity just really is, um, you know, a life, well, I lost it, a lifetime practice for, I can get in here again. I don't know if, <laughs> are you there? Am I back? Yes. Okay. Uh, I won't touch anything else on the computer because I disappeared. Um, so it, it just seems now that, that in, in this time when resilience is so important, when it's so important for us to treat each other and ourselves, treat each other with uh, kindness and clarity, that this is just a, um, a really worthy aspiration to become more, more equanimous, um, you know, just more... Um, 
more, I love the word composure, to have a kind of composure in the face of, of these uh, difficulties. And of course, you know, having some composure um, really is helpful to other people, you know, not to freak out, uh, just to, to really be, to be the calm presence. And um, many people have um, remarked on Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, comments about how when the, the boats were, were leaving Vietnam and people were so uh, distressed and anxious, and he said, you know, if one person was really calm, that person could kind of infuse the everyone else with that kind of calmness and stability, and they got through. So, you know, having this aspiration to be the equanimous person, the person who is composed, not falling through extremes, seeing clearly. And out of that clear seeing, just responding with this real heartfelt compassion, just seems to me to be such a, a worthy aspiration uh, for us. So with that, I would um, be eager to hear your comments, responses, experiences. And just unmute yourself and jump in. Can you just repeat what you said that that committee member or whatever said about show up, be present? Show up, pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Tell the truth. And don't be invested in a particular outcome. Um, you're missing. Um, working with uh, incarcerated people. I have a sort of uncle by friendship. I, my best friend uh, growing up, his uncle, Roy, is uh, was a uh, corrections officer. Mm -hmm. And this was in the 60s. So he got mm -hmm. caught up in a major, very major riot at Rikers Island. And because he is the person he is, he was protected by certain numbers of prisoners. Mm -hmm. So they held him safe from mm -hmm. anything that was happening around, around them. And he's written this book called Making the Right Moves, which I begun to read and I realized, oh, I remember when this happened. And then sending it to him, he's now in his 90s, I'm sending it to him to ask him to autograph for me. And in my note to him, I'm saying, you know, you've been such an important part of my life all growing up. Because mm -hmm. I had forgotten those memories, but he went, they wouldn't tell his mother was still alive. They wouldn't tell her anything that was going on. So she was left in the dark. And she was an intelligent woman, older, of course. But her, her daughter would be Roy's sister. Um, they're all like family to me. They're, ever since my teens, I'm still connected to him. He's written this book, and I'm sending it back to him, asking him to graph it remembering that the first parts I read about it, I was a part of, I was a part of this drama that was going on in his life. And it was, I guess he is and has been just the most calm person ever. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially why I think, not only calm, but good. He's just a good person. He would not, that's why he would be protected by prisoners mm -hmm. in, in the face of a riot, mm -hmm. thought of that. Hi everyone. I um, <clears throat> I um, came across a quote on um, some mental health video about COVID brain or something, uh, grieving, and um, it said um, we cannot control being changed by the pandemic, but we have some say over how we're going to be changed. And that just, um, when you were just talking about the conditions, causes and conditions. Mm -hmm. And I found that really liberating. And, um, and then I have a question about, about equanimity, well, I guess too. Um, it seems tonight that you're focusing more on uh, being pushed around by a uh, more afflictive side of experience. Mm -hmm. But it, 
it does include also being pushed around by pleasant, right? I mean, overexcitement, you know, like, because I feel myself, I, it's late in my practice, but I'm really seeing the dukkha of, uh, you know, I'm going along, could be neutral, it could be whatever I, and then uh, I get a little hit, something, it's almost like the fish coming to the surface. Mm -hmm. for the, the whole system kind of goes like, oh, and it feels really nice, but then there's also this part that's, now it's kind of off, it has to be restored. It has to come back to uh, calm or to- Sort of equilibrium. Neutral, yeah, equilibrium or neutrality or whatever. And I, you know, I, I like, I want, you know, the pleasant, lovely, but there's something a little extra there that kind of, you know, that that goes so it yeah am I on the right track right it okay it, so the, the classic the classic um equanimity story that I didn't tell because I wasn't sure there was time okay. is a, a Chinese Chan story and it's the story of a farmer who has uh, this wonderful beautiful stallion ah. and the stallion runs off and everyone says the villagers say oh what a shame and the farmer says well we'll see and the horse comes back and he brings three or four mares with him. And everyone says, oh, they're so fortunate. What, what good luck. And the farmer says, well, we'll see. And then the farmer's son uh, tries to get the, the new horses to submit to the saddle and bridle. And they throw him off, breaks his leg. And oh, what a, and he can't help out them with the, the farm. Well, what a misfortune. You know, again, we'll see. And then the, the emperor's people come by and they're drafting young men to go in the army. And so, of course, the farmer's son can't be drafted because he's got a broken leg. So, um, you know, and the story, it, it, you know, iteration after iteration. Yeah. So no matter what happens, we, we don't know what is going to happen next. So the idea when, um, you know, we're, we're really exuberant. Um, and, and the Buddha, you know, I mentioned that word, um, Pamada, the, the sort of inebriation, the Buddha uh, has this very interesting um, sutra where he, he talks about intoxicated by vitality. Oh. Um, people don't think that they're, um, you know, they're ever going to die. Intoxicated by good health and, and all these sorts of, of uh, intoxicated by youth um, and, and uses that, that word. So, you know, when things are really good. I mean, I, you know, when I grew up, when, when something good happened, I would say to myself, okay, wait for the other shoe to drop. And I never completely enjoyed it. Um, and um, and I, <laughs> I don't do that anymore. But, it, it, and I, I think a lot of people go through their lives thinking, you know, if something good's going to happen, it's just setting me up for a terrible fall. I'm actually much more Aquinas, but you know, when something good happens, I really enjoy it, and I really know how impermanent this is going to be. And when we're really exuberant like that, you know, kind of giddy with happiness, it really is a feeling like intoxication. You know, if we bring mindfulness to it, that that giddy euphoria um, is, we may think it's a pleasant feeling, but if we bring mindfulness to that sort of giddiness, it's often really not. It, it feels a little out of control. Uh, agitating. Right? Yeah. Fuzzy and, yeah. 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 So yeah, th there is that, that sense of um, you know, not being, um, you know, good things happen and um, bad things happen. And we, you know, we just, what we know is that everything is, is impermanent. Well, I've thought of this a lot in terms of uh, even the concept of white privilege, the word privilege or, or unearned advantage. You know, the question, is it really? I mean, you know, there's material advantage and power and all that, but is that in a spiritual sense really an advantage because it doesn't stimulate, it doesn't impel one to seek, right? It, it, um, that kind of advantage can lead to complacency. And, and for those of you who've listened to Shelley's wonderful talk that was on um, the 10% happier, I mean, she, she yeah. does talk about how um, 
you know, sort of living in, in a sort of white privilege uh, enclave, how um, there were very warm, deep um, cultural sorts of, of relationships that she really missed out on, um, that we do miss out on. So I think you're, you're right on there. I, I'm kind of a beginner, and I just had a question. I, I so aspire to equanimity, equanimity mm -hmm. but fail, fail miserably often. And don't know how to frame that in my practice and in my life, and just trying to move, move forward with all this um, when you have failures. I don't know if you have anything to say or offer. I, I hope this will be, be useful, but I think often that, um, that we can, can, first of all, just take, uh, really appreciate our good intentions. Really appreciate the intentions that we have. And then I think that the response always when, um, you know, when we have a lot of reactivity, when we're not being equanimous, it's to have compassion for the reactivity because that's suffering. So self-compassion, I think, is the appropriate response over and over and over again when we uh, disappoint ourselves and we don't live up to our own expectations, um, to really look at our, our good intentions, to realize how hard it is, how hard it is to undo all this conditioning that, that we've had that um, really encourages us to be, um, you know, sort of in, living in, in extremes. I mean, it, it's part of our consumer culture that we're always kind of egged on to the next thing. And, and it's just a very stimulative um, culture. So if you can have um, self-compassion in that to realize that, you know, this is really hard to do, first of all, and to realize that lots of other humans struggle with this very same thing, just like yourself, and feel that sort of, um, that you would be completely understood. But how, you know, all those other persons who are, are also struggling to, to do this. And then just really offer yourself loving kindness. Um, does that help? Oh my gosh. And it could not be more timely. I don't even know how to thank you so much for that information. It's just so helpful. And, and having all of you here, I really appreciate it. Thank so you, you're, you're very thank welcome. You. Anything else? I want to throw in a phrase that keeps coming up for me, mm -hmm. and Mark says it often, is don't throw anyone out of your heart. That's huge. That's really, really significant for me. Mm -hmm. So think in those terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's, it, it is a real practice. A real practice not to throw anyone out of our heart. And, and it's really compassion, I think, that enables us to, um, to do that. That we can have the, the loving kindness aspiration about being, um, you know, but benevolent toward all beings. Um, but some of the beings um, commit so much harm that it's only by having that compassion for the sort of um, suffering that um, brought them to that place. You know, the way things have come to be, the way this person has come to be, and to just have some, uh, some real compassion uh, around that, um, I think, is a way to to hold people in our in our hearts. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Equanimity is um, it's kind of been on my mind a lot because you know I'm kind of struggling with it. I think that I I know that I had um, expectations without conscious expectation that all of this around the pandemic would be better at a certain mm -hmm. point. Somehow that was the um, that was my expectation. And um, as you know, in some of the Southern, I'm in a Southern state and Florida, and as you know, 
And I've just noticed in the last um, couple of weeks, as things have gotten worse in Florida, I'm noticing there is just no hope of equanimity right now. I mean, just, but just to hear mm -hmm. that, it's like, okay, I have this practice. I can work on it. What you said was really helpful, just about, you know, that self-compassion mm -hmm. that I am so reactive to everything. And then I'm struggling so much with this and, and that we all are. And just, you know, to kind of hold that. And that's very, very helpful because, you know, I'm just feeling like, oh my God, oh my God, you know, all of that, like the agitation is like, all right, <laughs> settle down. And that's why I think really equanimity is, is seen as the last of the Brahma Viharas, that, that it really is the most, um, the most difficult um, of all of them to, uh, to really uh, have that as a refuge. You know, the, the Buddha said, no, we can place our minds in, in any, any one of these four states, that, that one of them is always available. And a lot of times it's going to be self-compassion or uh, you know, loving kindness toward, your, toward oneself um, because it may be really, really hard to be equanimous, really hard to be equanimous when we see, you know, um, people um, suffering in a way that just seems really gratuitous out of other people's carelessness or uh, disregard. It, it makes it very, um, it, it's really hard to see that. And so, you know, we really, really work on, on kind of understanding how things have come to be this way. So I really want to thank you all for um, having participated in this and, um, and doing this. And um, uh, I also uh, want to uh, apologize if I have done anything that has offended anyone. Um, it was not my intention, but you know, intention doesn't mitigate impact. So I just want to um, I, I am, uh, would be grateful to, to know if I have done anything that has hurt anyone in any, any possible um, way. So, um, so thank you all for um, participating and may you be well and, and happy. Um, and really, and, and let's just um, offer the, you know, whatever merit we've had from doing this um, this practice together, whatever benefit we have, but let's just in our, our hearts just offer this so freely and gladly to those who have helped us along the way, um, those who are suffering to beings known and unknown throughout the cosmos. May all beings be liberated. May all beings find ease. May all beings live in peace and harmony. So, Thank you so much. Take care.